and start and stop in the chat, you know, when, whenever we are run. And so, um, uh, hi everyone, this is uh, Learning Stats with our book club and um, Esmeralda is gonna talk, continue um, chapter six, uh, chapter five, descriptive stats. Um, uh, over to you, Esmeralda. Right, let me share my screen. Yeah, from on past session, we saw until, yeah, the basic measures of um, central, the, the central um, deviation measures. And now in section 5.3, we are going to start from skew and kurtosis. Um, but yeah, basically the skewness of a data set is um, the degree of asymmetry of the data set. Uh, could be seen as, or could be qualitatively classified as negative skew, uh, not skew at all, or positive skew. Um, yeah. When a data set is positive skew means that a lot of data are going uh, to the positive extreme values, while negative is the opposite. A new no skew at all means that it is completely balanced. There is a formula in here to uh, calculate the skewness of a data set. Uh, yeah. And if you can see, it's based on how each data is, um, where is the distance from, from the mean values. But to make our life easier, we have a function from the package psych that is a skew that calculates the skewness of a data set. For example, uh, with the data we have been working so far, yeah, we use this uh, function and obtain this estimated of the degree of skewness. On the other hand, we have another uh, measure, rather another way that describes the dispersion of the data, which is uh, kurtosis. In kurtosis is the could be seen as a measure of the pointiness of the data set. Uh, in qualitative terms, we can divide this in three categories. For example, we say that a data set have a platycurtic distribution where it is like too flat, mesocurtic when it is like regular, normal. Um, and leptocurtic when it is like too pointy, but it has like a lot of data in the center of the distribution. Um, yeah, this, the degree of kurtosis can be seen in this um, basic table. Uh, there is a formula to estimate the kurtosis of a data set. Here we have it. Um yeah, when we can say, for example, that a data set has a platycurtic distribution where the kurtosis value is negative, is mesocurtic when the kurtosis value is zero, and um, leptocurtic when the kurtosis value is positive. So yeah, there is a function in the package psych to estimate the kurtosis of a data set. You will have this, how, how this function works. Um, yeah. Another thing that we could, or, or we would like to uh, have when we are exploring or describing a data set is having an overall summary of our data set. Um, here is where the authors introduce the function summary, which 
yeah, basically it's giving us all the, or most of the measure we have been seeing so far. It provides us like the median, the mean, the range, and the uh, first quantile and the third quantile. And yeah, it is like, it's a like very handy function, but on the other hand, have some disadvantages that, that it is like the results depends of the type of data we are using as input. For example, if we input logical, uh, an object of class logic, for example, saying like if our numeric value, if each of our numeric values of our data set is bigger than 50. Uh, yeah, this what it what it what this is like um, bit of code is doing is like just giving true or false for each value saying whether, whether or not each value is like above 50. So if we introduce this data frame in the summary function, what we obtain is just like like a frequency table of uh, how many faults we have and how many truths we have. That is not giving us so, nothing like the median or the mean or something like that. And if we introduce a factor object, which is, this is an object we previously convert to if you remember, this is just the name of the, the what? Or the uh, basketball teams play in a season. And we convert it to logical object. And if we use it with the function summary, we can see that we obtain again a frequency uh, table. So, yeah. But, Yeah, we can we can use the function summary in data frames as well. Uh, let me show him this clinical trial. Clinical trial is this data frame when we have three types. Yeah, I think how many types? Three types of drugs, two therapies, and if um, the treatment improves their their mouth or the mouth of the patient. And the function summary in the case of data frames is like giving us the uh, summary for each column, but it doesn't allow like, for example, at this point doesn't allow like having more information. The psych package that we have been talking this chapter has a function called described, which they say like could be more informative because for example, it converts the non-numeric variables into numerical variables. But yeah, to rise an alert, they put on like a mark, this a symbol, symbol in the variables that were converted into numeric variables to like say that the information from, from these variables could be like uh, uninformative or possibly uh, useless. However, when a variable is non-converted code, like the function code works well and be informative. Um, yeah. The authors say that this is better because, yeah, allow, allow working with uh, non-numeric data sets. Or else they introduce another function called describe by, which is for providing statistics by groups. And in this case, uh, yeah, they, the group they set is therapy. And yeah, basically it's giving the same, like the, the basic statistics, but these names like for each group. 
Um, or else. But if we want to see, for example, this. Yeah, this like these uh, interactions, but between our variables says that it could be done with the same function, function described by, but the author recommends using aggregate function uh, instead because could be like more uh, easily to use that with, with uh, could be written with le less lines. And for example, we could just introduce the formula or the ways we well, want to uh, combine the variables and the function we want to obtain. We can like say just a function or several uh, functions if we want to see other things like for example, the standard deviation or the median. I think there is no such thing. But for the mean, for example, or the kurtosis, we can, um, change or set the function we want to see using combinations of variables. And yeah, right. the next section of the chapter is standard scores. Um, yeah, basically the standard scores is a way to describe how far is a given data from the um, from the distribution or the mean values of the data set. And here is giving an example. For example, they, they uh, mention um, like a fictitious a study where we have like one, one million people responding uh, questions about how, I mean, the answers, you, there are two ways a patient can respond a question, like in a happy way or in a grumpy way. But for example, it could be way where say that if a patient respond like 70% of the questions in a grumpy way, saying that the patient is 70% grumpy. So um, rather than that, they say like could be like more reasonable describe, for example, how far or how different is that patient or what is the deviation of that patient from from the media to know, for example, how ill or how like odd is her, her case or their case, the cases. Um, yeah, it says that it could be done by using the, this could be uh, done using the percentiles. For example, saying that, mm, if we have like the, the distribution of all the all the patients, for example, we can say that that patient is in the 0.016% of the people of grumpiness. And we can describe the, the data in, in that way using the percentiles. However, um, it says that that is not the best way it is percentiles represent the relative position of a data point within a distribution. The recommended approach in this case is use standard scores um, that refers to the relative position of particular data or value within the distribution. And something useful from the standardized scores or the standard score is that um, the data are normalized and standardized, so it can be useful for doing comparisons between different data sets. And the standard score is calculated just like the raw score, um, subtracting the mean and dividing between the standard deviation. 
for example, here we have a like a manual way to estimate the C scores. And yeah, it says that it, for interpret interpreting this, the authors mentioned like recalling the information provided in section 5.2.5, where they say that, for example, 99.7% uh, of the data are expected to lie within three standard deviations of the mean. This is like a rule made by convention, rather, that's something. Um, Estimated is, is, is more like a convention. So, for example, if we obtain a C score of 3.5, means that we have like a like a very um, a value very far away from from the center of the distribution. So yeah, there is a function that it says that it could be it it will be. Uh, use like more intensively in the chapter nine, but which is P norm. But at the moment it is saying it can be uh, used for estimating which percentile correspond to the to a C score of 3.6. In this case, um yeah, the theoretical percentile is 99.98, which means that is like this person is like really grumpier than all the uh, other people. And yeah, where else? The next sec section is correlation. We start with, with uh, how we are, or how we can describe the relationships between the variables in, in the data. So for this, we are going to use a data set called parenthood, which is like this saying, for example, um, how much the mood of a parent depends on how many hours the baby uh, sleep, in the sense that, for example, it, one could be thought that if the child is like sleeping very few hours or a very irregular intervals, the parents can have like worse mood. So yeah, here we have the data set with just parenthood. Uh, then sleep means the hours the father is sleeping. Baby sleep is the hours the baby is sleeping. And then grump means in a scale from zero to 100, how much the father, or in this case, Dan, is uh, angry? Or what is the, their, their degree of uh, grumpiness? So it's measured for 100 day, days. And uh, initially, we described this data set with histograms and with the basic uh, me statistical measures that we, we have been seeing so far. And we can see, for example, that, um, yeah, for example, that the parent is like, uh, the degree of the father, he is done asleep. The kurtosis, for example, is negative. So really meaning the father is not meaning so much hours, so enough hours. And um, yeah, initially we could see like there is a degree of relationship, but we cannot like be certain. There is um, a statistical ways for measuring this, the relationship between two variables. Uh, for these, we have to, or we can initially explore this by uh, a scatter plot. For example, in here we have the degree of grumpiness of the father versus their hours of sleeping. 
we can see, for example, that if the father sleeps more hours, uh, is like less grumpy. And if the baby sleep more hours, again, the father is less uh, grumpy. So, um, but yeah, so as I mentioned, there is like a statistical way of measuring this. The most common way of doing this is by using the correlation coefficient, which is the, is, more or more specifically is the Pearson's correlation coefficient, which traditionally is denoted by the letter R. Uh, the correlation coefficient, mm, yeah, measures the degree of relationship re relationship between two variables. And something good is that when there is uh, when there is an um, our value of less one means that the variables have a perfect negative relationship. Well, we have if we have a R of one, it means that we have a perfect positive relationship. And when we have R, means that there is no relationship at all. And that is illustrated on this image. For example, we have here that like this scatter plot is like completely, uh, let's say, dispersed. The points are completely dispersed, doesn't show like any pattern. So the uh, relationship or the R value is zero. And if in in if if the relationship is increasing, the like the value of the R value is tending is going to be tending to one or min, 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 minus one. Um, the yeah, says like the formula for the Pearson's correlation can be written in different ways, but the accordingly to the author, the simplest way to write it is like first introduce the, the idea of covariance between two variables, the variable X and the variable Y. And um, yeah, this is a generalization of the notion of variance. It says that it's mathematically simple way of describing the relationship between two variables. Um, here we have the formula. So you can see, for example, is measuring how much a data is um, separating or what is the distance from of a given value from the mean. But then the multiplications is relating them. And then <clears throat> the data are considering the yeah. Yeah, multiplying is considering their relationship. And I think here, considering in, if we are, are dividing by the number of observations, we are normalizing the data, I think. Um, yeah, but it says that in simple way, in, in simple terms, the yeah the here can be seen as the uh, average cross product between x and y so one uh, disadvantage or critique to the covariance as a, it, as you can see from the formula is definitely measuring by itself the degree of relationship between two variables, but cannot be used or is not frequently used as a measure of a correlationship between two variables because it doesn't provide an standardized measure of the association. This means that the covariance is affected by the scales and units of the 
uh, measurements of the variables uh, that involved. And therefore, it could be difficult to compare the strength of associations across different studies or variables. For example, in this example, it says that, um, for example, in, in the example we are seeing, X refers to the done sleep variable, where the units are hours, and Y refers to the done grump variable, where the units are grumps, then the, then the units for the covariance will be hours um, per, per grumps, which doesn't have much sense. So that, that is the problem with the covariance. So this is solved by using the Pearson correlation coefficient, or R, which uh, fixes this problem by standardizing the covariance. Uh, this is in the same way that we, uh, that the C score standardizes the row scores, which is by dividing by the standard deviations. Uh, as, however, because we have two variables that contribute to the covariance, the standardizations have to be done using the two standard deviations. And then we have here the formula for the Pearson's uh, coefficient where the covariance is divided between the two standard uh, deviations. And then we have the yeah the values where uh, R as as I mentioned R equal to one implies a perfect positive relationship and R equal to uh, negative one implies a perfect negative relationship. And the way for calculating this in R is using the core function, example where we uh, input the x variable and the y variable, and it is going to give us the, uh, the, the Pearson's correlation or the R. And yeah, in this case, we have C that we have like almost a perfect negative correlation, which is like reasonable accordingly to our uh, scatter plot. When it says that, for example, the function is more powerful than that and can give us the, the correlation indexes or the correlation values, sorry, for uh, between all the possible combinations of the variables we have in, in our uh, data frame. And now how we are going to interpret these index, these, um, these values, it says that it depends what you want to use for the data or what is the purpose of, of your analysis or your, yeah, it, it depends on the study or the purpose of your, your uh, having or your research goals. Um, definitely says like emphasizes that definitely depends a lot on the context for example, it says that there is like some things in psychology. Uh, I don't know what it is, but for example, test theories, how people judge similarities, where, for example, achieve a correlation below 0.9 means that definitely it is like unsuccessful. But it is not the case for all these situations. There is even cases where a uh, correlation or 0.4 or 0.3 could be like uh, be considered reasonable depending on the case. But usually it's just like there is like a very generic table. It is not properly a guide, but it's a table like how could like interpret interpret the um, the relationship this one but yeah could, should be used careful and other thing that is mentioned that we for interpreting our 
a correlation value, our R, we have to visualize of the data before any interpretation. Because for example, it is saying, it is putting an example of a data set called the ANSCOMS Quartet, which refers to four data sets that have um, nearly identical statistical properties, but they have very different distributions and relationships. Here we have like the four data sets. We, ca we can see, for example, that definitely they have different um, behaviors and relationships, but they have like almost identical statistics. And the Pearson's correlation value for all the four data set is 8 point, sorry, 0 0.81. And this data set is used for emphasize the importance of the data visualizations for doing any interpretation of our like statistics. Uh, yeah, the next thing is the Spearman's rank correlations. It says that the Pearson's correlation coefficient is very useful and is like, uh, like very, use across the like the uh, knowledge areas, but it has some shortcomings. One problem is that it's designed to measure the strength of linear relationship between two variables. And it is like the main thing that limits this, this kind of um, measure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, there is problematic when the relationship between the, the variables is not necessarily linear. And for this, for, uh, for showing this, the book is using this data set called E4, which in the, which is showing, for example, that depending on the hours uh, studied by uh, a student, is the grade uh, they are going to, to receive. For example, something um, outstanding of this kind of relationship is that there is like a kind of a threshold or a tipping point where you can like really have a, or get a really good improvement of in, in, your, in the grades you, you can have. For example, if you start to like reading the, the, your uh, notebooks or attending to your classes or conferences or seeing tutorials, you can like definitely get a, like a rapidly increase in your or abrupt increase in the, in the uh, received grades. However, from this point onwards, it could be more like uh, difficult to get an improvement because implies that, for example, uh, achieving like the most like or the top grade means that you have really, really have to make a like a strong effort, for example, by uh, memorizing complicated uh, concepts or um, reading very specialized books. So yeah, it, it is, as, as you can see, the relationship is kind of linear, but not, it is, I mean, a linear, a, a linear uh, relationship will not be the best way of describing this, this uh, data. So yeah, here we have the data. And if you use like the data as, as they are with the function core, we are going to get, for example, an almost perfect relationship. But the truth is that if we visualize, visualize the data set, this, this is not the uh, degree of relationship or that we want to 
obtain or, or explain. So um, what we are looking for is something that captures the fact that there is a perfect ordinal relationship here. There is, if a student one works more hours than a student two, then we can guarantee that a student one will get the better degree. There is not with a correlation where R is equal to 0.9 size at all. So for like, um, what, what we can, or we can solve this by uh, ranking our data. So it's like, for example, if we're looking for ordinal relationship, all we have to do is treat the data as, as ordinal, uh, in an ordinal scale. So for measuring effort in terms of hours worked, let's rank all the 10 students Ten students in order in order of the hours worked. For example, if the student one worked at least just two hours, they got the lowest rank, which is uh, one. If the student four was the next laziest and studied only six hours, it will get the next lower rank, which is two. And yeah, then we will rank the data in, in all the data of the 10 students in the same way. And what, what we obtain is like this, rank table, if you can see, like yeah, in this case, the ranked variables are equal. And if we, yeah, yeah, in this case, for example, we can do those manually, but in R, we can just use the function rank for each variable and then use the function core for obtaining the correlation between these two uh, ranked val values. And we have a R value of one. But to make like this way shorter, we can just like using the core function, both specifying that the method we want to use is Spearman and automatically this um, this code is going to rank each the each our data. And yeah, what else? We have the correlate some like some particularities of the correlate function. So for example, ah uh, yeah, one thing that could, that the author critiques or mention about the core um function is that it doesn't work with non-numeric values which have completely sense but it says that the their function correlate ignores any non-numeric variables and uses only the numeric variables to obtain correlations and the final section is like handling mis missing values like there are two cases where one is the single variable case when we have just like one in, in a column or in a variable, we have just like very few NAs and we can just just like NA.RM or NA remove with the uh, as true, just like to ignore the NAs. But the second case is having NAs in like pairwise calculations where we have like, for example, compare our data. And yeah, here for this, these like, for example, we, we can use the function core, correlate, but including an argument which is used with two uh, possible 
options, complete.ops, which is just like removing the rows that have NAs. Well, and the other option is like use pairwise.complete.ops, which means that depending on the variables we are going to use for the correlation chip, or depending on the, the two variables that is correlating, it ignores the uh, the the missing NAs, but not from all the all the data frame, just from the two columns involved. Uh, it says that these have like two the two approaches have different strengths and weaknesses. The pairwise complete has advantage that it keeps more observations. So you can make use more data. But on the other hand, mean that every correlation in your correlation matrix is computed from a slightly different set of observations, which can be like all uh, when you want to compare the different correlation ship and also depends on the degree of how many data um, miss you have. So which one you have to use is depend on the the way you think your values are missing and the number of NAs you, you have. And yeah, this yeah, it's the chapter is finished. The, do you Thank have you. questions, comments? Uh, no, I think I'm good. Federica, you wanted to say something? Yeah. Um um i like to know how do you uh your reasoning about choosing between uh different correlation methods how do you choose between like pearson um if so do you do you need to choose or you just can like try uh, one of those and then how and what way you will choose uh, one more than another if it's the case or you you might want to try both of them and then what would you do what i will do is like looking into the scatter plots to see what is, for example, the kind of relationships between the two. Um, yeah, to see, for example, like a linear relationship can like at least provide like a good, measurement of the relationship or an acceptable relationship of the data. Um, in the case of the Pierce Spearman's rank correlation, I am not sure when I will choose it because I don't know if here, I mean, in this figure, for example, we have like a line connecting the the dots and you can see, for example, that uh, and we know the meaning of the variables and the dots are connected. So we can infer that it is like, the, I mean, the behavior of the relationship is like first increasing and then go steady. But imagine if we don't have like this line connecting the dots, I mean, Personally, I would use a linear relationship. So I I don't know. I am still not sure when I, for example, would choose a Spearman rank correlationship. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, yeah, well, so. I, you're on mute, Federica. Yeah. Uh, I was reading this uh, this um, uh, this explanation, this caption um, in the figure, yeah, figure five point eleven, and uh, I think it mentions both of them. As I can see, this produces a strong Pearson correlation, and then this reflects in a Spearman uh, Spearman correlation. Um, 
I think that they are adjustments to each other. So they they is slightly different, but there is a um, um, something that is um, so here it says the dashed line through the middle uh, shows the linear relationship. Okay, and this is clear between the two variables. This produces a strong Pearson correlation of 0.91. And then says, however, the interesting thing to note here is that there's actually a perfect monotonic relationship between the two variables. So in this toy example, at least, increasing the hours worked always increases the grade received. So as is illustrated by the solid line, this is reflected in a Spearman correlation of perfectly one. So they are perfectly correlated. With such a small data set, however, it's an open question as to which version better describe the actual relationship involved. So uh, there is a, this mention about monotonic, uh relationship so when uh, uh the data are going on uh, clearly towards um uh, a direction so they follow a path so they're not just as you said you know there's a but it, um, it's clearly showing uh, a trend let's say okay towards some uh um, an increase or a decrease and uh, here they say that they clearly shows a monotonic trend at least for some part of the linear relationship because as you can see it starts growing then about 30 hours get steady and uh, so the, the the growth become uh, a steady growth and then there is a, like at about 50 hours worth, uh, even a, a further uh, inclination. And then slightly, the, it, start, seems, it seems like uh, start growing back again. Mm. How would you describe? So the, this is monotonic uh, in the main that as a, a trend since some some point and then another uh, uh, bit of uh, similar uh, trend. So the points follow similar um, path. Uh, and for for this reason, now we we don't we don't have uh, the, the 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 formula for the two, don't we? Uh, let me. But I I don't think so. Like I think no, but let me check quickly. Here's a Pearson. Because you know you try both of them and then uh, then you assess the fact that there is a correlation or there is not a correlation. So they both so basically one is more it, it's a stronger um, affir um, affirmation of the uh, correlation between the variable because the, the Pearson is no point nine, uh, while the Spearman is exactly one. So it's it's a confirmation that. There is a strong correlation within the variables. But uh, yeah. Possibly knowing, for example, knowing like a priori the behavior of our variable. I mean, if you study more hours, you never are, are going to get like a worse qualification yeah a, a worst grade so well for example a linear relationship called like saying that possibly you call like getting deviate from from that increasing trend however mm -hmm. if you know like a priori that if 
you are going to never go to a worse grave if you study more hours. You can say that, for example, in this case, the Pearson correlation will be better. I, I don't know. I, I is what I. Well, yeah, you I you have to yeah you have to be right because you say you more more hours spent it it's it's a better result okay but in fact you in the trend you can see that at some point there is a like uh, so yeah you you can study up a certain number of hours after that you're tired mm -hmm. somehow. Of the same topic, oh, I'm, 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 I don't know, but it somehow it gets steady, growing uh, more, um, much slower than before, even yeah. if you study more hours. Um, yeah, makes sense. Even if they, it's a, it's a small data set, it does make sense. I think uh, here we have more information uh the pearson correlation no yeah yeah just where we where we were sorry to interrupt i have to rush for to ah. into another meeting so i'm yeah. gonna head out uh, thank you Spirilla, for a great discussion uh feel free to carry on a few more minutes all right bye-bye bye thank you bye thank you thank you bye-bye okay uh so um i'll put the end